Hello, and welcome to the ABA section of Environment, Energy, and Resources podcast. My name is Mary Ann Grena Manley, and I'm a Deputy Editorial Director with Bloomberg Environment. Our guests today are Alice Caslon, Professor and Dean Circle Scholar, the University of San Francisco School of Law, and James May, Distinguished Professor of Law at Widener University Delaware Law School in Wilmington, Delaware. Today's podcast is intended to be a preview of the 26th Fall Conference Supreme Court panel discussion we'll be having in San Diego on October 18th. During the 90-minute educational session in San Diego, we'll provide an in-depth review of recent decisions and upcoming cases, highlighting how actions by the nation's highest court might impact your practice. The panel members also will offer their thoughts on the changing makeup of the court with the retirement of Justice Kennedy and also we'll discuss the cases awaiting oral argument and those cert-worthy cases waiting in the wings. So, on that note, what I'd like to do is ask Alice and Jim the same question. What case currently awaiting oral argument before the Supreme Court are you keeping your eye on, and why? So, Jim, I'll start with you. Uh, I'm actually watching two two cases carefully. So, um, there's one about frogs in Louisiana and the other is about moose in Alaska. So the first is Weyerhaeuser versus U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So this involves the dusky gopher frog, uh, and it's it's before the Supreme Court. Um, And it also involves the future of the Endangered Species Act uh, Critical Habitat uh, Designation Authority under Section 4 of the ESA. It's on appeal from the Fifth Circuit, and it involves uh, a species, this this frog. It needs... um, small temporal forest ponds to breed, and it needs to live in tall, widely spaced treetops. It sounds like a great existence to me. And as an uh, advent uh, to listing the frog as endangered under Section 4 of the ESA, the the service also designated more than 1,500 acres of privately owned forest in Louisiana as critical habitat. So the designation essentially stopped development. Um, The the costs are disputed but uh, are alleged to be up to $34 million dollars. And the problem is that the the frog hasn't been seen in this habitat for more than 50 years, and that ultimately led to the landowner's challenge um, as to whether it's really critical uh, habitat. So the Fifth Circuit upheld the designation insofar as it's based upon best uh, practicable knowledge about the frog's uh, uh, choices, if you will, and the Supreme Court uh, granted the landowner's um, cert petition in January to address two issues. The first is whether the ESA prohibits designation of private land um, as unoccupied critical habitat that is neither habitat nor essential to species conservation. And second is whether the agency's decision not to exclude an area of critical habitat designation because of the economic impact of designation is subject to judicial review. So argument is scheduled for October 1st. My guess, and it's again, it's, um, it's impossible to know in prognostication is frolic, but my guess is that a Kavanaugh uh, included um, Supreme Court would reverse um, on at least the second issue if he participates in the opinion, um, and that's because of his propensity to elevate consideration of costs on industry and landowners um, over uh, environmental externalities. The second case, uh, case I'm watching uh, closely is Sturgeon versus Frost, uh, and this is a long and complicated case, but it involves hunting with hovercraft in Alaska. So John Sturgeon um, would like to use his hovercraft on uh, what's known as the Nation River to reach moose hunting grounds in Alaska's Yukon Charlie National Preserve Conservation Unit, which is designated as such and protected as such under ANILCA, the Alaska National Interest uh, Lands Conservation Act. While this is fine with the state of Alaska for him to hunt the moose and um, use his hovercraft to do it, it runs afoul of National Park Service regulations. So Sturgeon um, argued that Alaska owns the the Nation River in essence so that the National Park Service can't prohibit the use of the hovercraft on that portion of the river that to do so violates federalism and the guarantee clause and a whole variety of things. So on um, the case has a history and on an early remand from the U.S. Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit held that this portion of the Nation River is subject to ANILCA and NPS regulation, that federal regulation is fine, and that under Ninth Circuit precedent, the U.S. has uh, an implied reservation of water rights. Um, so they affirmed the district court summary judgment for the federal government, uh, and the, so the, the question now is elevated before the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so it remains to be seen, of course, what happens, but a Kavanaugh-included Supreme Court 
uh, would, uh, would seem quite possibly to have um, by votes to overturn National Park Service authority on at least federalism ground, if not guarantee clause ground, if not commerce or property clause grounds of the U.S. Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Alice, you're up. All right, so the case that I am looking at is Virginia Uranium versus Warren. And the question posed there is whether the Atomic Energy Act preempts Virginia's ban on uranium mining. And I'm interested in this case because I think federalism uh, is a very important issue and the degree to which uh, federal laws preempt the ability of states to take measures uh, on their own, I think, is, is going to be a, a very important question, especially if the federal government is moving toward a, a less regulation, that the issue will be whether states continue to have the authority or not to uh, to do their own environmental, make their own environmental rules. So in this case, uh, Virginia enacted a ban on uranium mining in the state uh, back in the 1980s, and it's now being challenged. Uh, there's a Virginia uranium company that owns land and or is uh, seeking to mine uranium from in Coles Hill, uh, the Pennsylvania deposit, and it is the largest uranium deposit in the country. 119 million pounds of uranium are estimated to be in the deposit, and it's valued at five to six billion dollars. So there's a lot of money at stake in Virginia uranium uh, being able to mine this area or not, something it currently can't do in light of the ban. So the Fourth Circuit held that the law was that Virginia's ban was not preempted. The Virginia ban, um, again, as I mentioned didn't allow uranium mining on private land. And the, and the question is whether the Atomic Energy Act preempts that. So let's look at what the Atomic Energy Act does preempt. It controls mining on federal lands, and the Atomic Energy Act preempts efforts by states to regulate the safety of post-mining activities. But the Atomic Energy Act on its face does not preempt state control of mining on private land, right? It preempts only mining on federal land and state regulation of post-mining safety, but does not regulate uranium, uh, the ability of states to control uranium mining itself. So the Fourth Circuit concluded that there was no field preemption, right? The, the federal statute was not comprehensive and did not cover the area of um, uranium mining on private land, so states could control that. And also concluded there was no conflict preemption because the country relies on other sources of uranium um, and this source is not necessary. There was a vigorous dissent by Justice Traxler <clears throat> on the Fourth Circuit, and he said that the purpose of the Virginia mining ban was really to control the risks, not from mining, but from uranium, uranium milling and tailings management, and those are matters that are preempted by the uh, Atomic Energy Act. Uh, and also that the uh, uranium ban conflicted with the federal goal of promoting private uh, private development of nuclear power. So one of the key questions for the court here, and the thing they spend, that the, both the majority and dissent spend a fair amount of time discussing, is when the court should inquire into the real legislative purpose. So the majority said, no, if the law is regarding an area where the states are free to regulate, then we leave that be. Um, whereas the dissent said, no, we have to look more deeply into the state's uh, purpose behind the mining ban to determine whether it was actually a pretext for controlling something that, uh, in fact, is preempted. So that's a lot of the discussion in the case. I think the larger picture questions are about federalism. Uh, from the <clears throat> state's perspective, they would argue the court should respect the Atomic Energy Act's balance between federal and state interests. Its assertion over uh, its clear assertion of federal control over post mining activities. Uh, but really leave the space for the state to control the mining itself. Um, versus, I think, the Virginia uranium perspective, and that is whether deep inquiries into legislative purpose are, are necessary to keep the states from doing end runs around the federal statutes. Um, so I think there are going to be important questions about whether the justices' views on states' rights end up shaping the outcome. Uh, how much will they be preserving state prerogatives and, and avoiding inquiries into state purpose when, uh, when the state is acting? 
Uh, and also will be interesting whether this, the justices' views on furthering resource development shape the outcome, right? To what degree um, do they want to, uh, you know, essentially keep states from being able to place roadblocks on regulatory, uh, place roadblocks on resource development? And I think both of those <coughs> values could end up shaping how the court ends up coming out on this case. In terms of what Justice Kavanaugh might do here, I think we don't have a lot of federalism jurisprudence from him to, to know exactly where he stands on that. Again, if he were to take the statute very literally, um, we see that it controlled mining and it didn't control <clears throat> the areas covered explicitly by the Atomic Energy Act. So if, if you look at this very literally, uh, then I think he might uphold the case, uphold the Fourth Circuit um, and say that it, the state's ban is not preempted. Um, but I think he does have, again, a, a skepticism of regulation and whether that ends up um, leading to, uh, you know, a, a, a deeper inquiry into what the legislature was trying to do here and, and whether it was trying to, to tread on ground that it's not supposed to, um, that could lead it the other way. So I think it's uncertain uh, what, a, what a Kavanaugh presence on this case would, uh, where that would lead. Okay. Thanks so much for your insights, Alice and Jim, and of course for joining us today. Uh, once again, I would like to encourage folks to come join us in San Diego for the 26th fall meeting that takes place October 17th through 20th, where you can hear more from Jim and Alice, uh, who will also be joined at that time by Timothy Bishop, a partner with Mayor Brown in Chicago. Timothy will be arguing before the Supreme Court on October 1st when it hears an Endangered Species Act we referred to, Weyerhaeuser versus U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He'll obviously have a tremendous insight to share, so we hope to see you there. This podcast was sponsored by the ABA Section of Environment, Energy, and Resources. You can find out more about the section, including how to join, on the web at www.americanbar.org slash environ. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>